Welcome to Transformed by Grace, an in-depth Bible study of God's Word, presented by the Berean Bible Society. Join us each time on this station as Pastor Kevin brings the transforming message of God's grace revealed through the Holy Scriptures. A church once had a custom that people celebrating birthdays come to the front of the auditorium. There they give an offering in thankfulness to the Lord for life while the congregation sings happy birthday. Sometimes, rather than go forward, shy people would give an anonymous offering to the Sunday school director. One Sunday, the director came forward and proclaimed, I have here an ominous birthday offering. And a gray-haired man spoke up and said, aren't they all? <laughs> We're going to look at a birthday celebration in this episode, and it was an ominous one. As a result of it, John the Baptist was murdered, and his head was offered up on a platter. Our Lord said in Matthew 15, 19, For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. Our Apostle Paul wrote in Galatians 5, 19 and 21, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings. We see most of these things in the description of John the Baptist's death. Murder is in the heart of mankind, women included, as we see by this account. Murder is a heart problem. It proceeds out of the sinful, selfish, old nature in each person. Only Christ can truly change and transform the heart and break the power of sin and the control of the old nature in our lives. Our responsibility as ambassadors for Christ to share the gospel of grace is what people need the most in this world. This is what will bring about true change in people's lives. Mark 6, 14 to 16 read, And King Herod heard of him, for his name was spread abroad, and he said, that John the Baptist was risen from the dead, and therefore mighty works do show forth themselves in him. Others said that it is Elias, and others said that it is a prophet, or as one of the prophets. But when Herod heard thereof, he said, It is John, whom I beheaded. He is risen from the dead. Verse 14 says that King Herod heard of him. King Herod here is Herod Antipas. He was the son of the infamous Herod the Great, the evil ruler who murdered the innocents in Bethlehem, children ages two years old and under. Mark called Antipas here a king. This title is used in a very loose and general sense, and it is what Herod liked to be called. According to Matthew and Luke, Herod Antipas was a tetrarch. When Herod the Great died, the Romans divided his territory among his three sons, and Antipas was made tetrarch and ruler over the regions of Perea and Galilee. Rome had ultimate authority over Israel at that time, and the Herods were just puppet kings and regional rulers who had to submit to Caesar and do his bidding. Whatever power they had was minimal. One false move, they would be replaced, exiled, or even executed. It says here that Herod Antipas heard of him, meaning Christ. He heard the news of Christ's ministry. Miracles were happening. People with diseases were being healed. Demons were being cast out. Great crowds were gathering to hear the Lord teach. Much of Christ's earthly ministry was carried out in the north of Galilee, over which Herod Antipas was tetrarch. Mark says that his name was spread abroad and the buzz reaches into the palace of Herod. But when he hears about it, he said that John the Baptist was risen from the dead and therefore mighty works do show, their for, show forth themselves in him. When Herod heard of Christ's miracles, his conscience began to prick and to bother him. The memory of the prophet whom he had beheaded immediately comes back to him. He tells his servants, it's John. He's come back from the dead. That explains these miracles. His mind goes to the worst possible scenario. 
to have the man he beheaded back from the grave, and his guilty conscience caused him to fear. While Herod thought it was John the Baptist, verse 15 said that others were saying that Christ was Elijah, or some were saying a prophet, or one of the prophets. There was confusion, there was speculation among the people about the Lord Jesus and who he was. Never occurred to them that Christ might be unique and totally different than anyone they had known or ever heard of. And it's the same with reactions today towards the Lord. Many have different viewpoints and different explanation as who they think the person of Christ is. And many want to try to fit Christ into a construct that they are familiar and comfortable with. And he was a moral man. He was a good teacher. He was a prophet. He was a good example. And all of these things fall so short. And it's simple for us who believe we know who he is. He is 100% God. He is Lord, He is the Creator, and He is the only Savior. While people were speculating, verse 16 shows that Herod kept insisting and was convinced that John was resurrected, that this Jesus who was performing wonderful mighty works was the resurrected John the Baptist who he had beheaded. John the Baptist had been a voice for God. Herod had silenced that voice. Now he was sure that John the Baptist had come back from the dead to haunt him and to condemn him. This was his deepest anxiety and his greatest fear. And we see by this how a guilty conscience can really torment a person. Mark 6, 17 through 20 read, For Herod himself had sent forth and laid hold upon John and bound him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. For John had said unto Herod, It is not lawful for thee to have thy brother's wife. Therefore Herodias had a quarrel against him, and would have killed him, but she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just man and unholy, and observed him. And when he had heard him, he did many things, and heard him gladly. At this point, Mark does a flashback to the past. He interrupts the narrative to review the circumstances surrounding the death of John. In chapter 1, verse 14 of Mark, we learn about John being arrested and being put into prison. He remained a prisoner for a long time, at least a year or more. Verses 17 through 18 here explain why John was put into prison. And it was on account of Herodias, because Antipas had married the wife of his brother, Philip. Herod Antipas' brother, Philip, was one of the many sons born of the many wives of Herod the Great. Philip lived in Rome as a private citizen. He had a wife. Her name was Herodias. Then it gets strange, and it gets complicated. Herodias was Herod the Great's granddaughter. She was the daughter of another son of Herod the Great, a daughter of one of Philip's half-brothers. So Herodias married her uncle, her father's half-brother, Philip. And then another uncle, Antipas, lured her away from her husband and married her. They were living in an adulterous, incestuous relationship. But you need to notice something here. Herodias is not called Herod's wife. It says that Antipas married her but she is called his brother Philip's wife. It was an unlawful marriage. She was still his brother Philip's wife. He stole her from his brother. Thus, she is not said to be his wife, though they were married, because she was still legitimately the wife of Philip, his brother. And the Bible does not recognize her as Herod's wife because of the sinful circumstances surrounding it. There's so much wrong with this situation and then John the Baptist came along, and he boldly pointed his finger at Herod and denounced him for his immorality. In a very direct way, as was John's personality, he said to Herod, It is not lawful for thee to have thy brother's wife. When he said lawful, he was speaking of the law of Moses, that this, was, that this relationship was contrary to the law. In the passages such as, Leviticus 20, 21, which says, And if a man shall take his brother's wife, it is an unclean thing. They lived under the law at that time. And John the Baptist, a prophet of God, was bold 
And part of the mark of his greatness was his fearlessness to confront the spiritual need of people and hold them accountable to God's standard of the law, even in high places, with leaders who held his life in their hands. That when, no matter the consequences, John held the people accountable. When Herod was rebuked by John, he would have put him to death. But Matthew 14, 5 explains, And when he would have put him to death, he feared the multitude, because they counted him as a prophet. The Jews rightly counted John as a prophet. Herod feared the multitude and knew if he had put him to death, they might react violently against him for John's execution. But Herodias was furious at John's rebuke, and to attempt to satisfy her rage, he had John arrested and bound him in prison for Herodias' sake, verse 17 says. It's been said that the ungodly like religion in the same way that they like lions, either dead or behind bars. They fear religion when it breaks loose and begins to challenge their consciences. Herodias' anger at John's rebuke becomes a settled grudge. She held it against him. She had a quarrel against him, it says. The prison wasn't enough for her. She was not satisfied with John's imprisonment. She hated him and craved his execution. She wanted him dead, but she could not, verse 19 says. She couldn't because Herod wouldn't allow it. The reason being... As it says in verse 20, he feared John. And he just keeps seeing this come up over and over again, how Herod lived by fear. You find how he feared the multitude when he didn't put John to death initially. He feared John, verse 20 says, when Herodias wanted John put to death. And after he did put him to death, he feared that John the Baptist was resurrected. And you see such a contrast here between Herod's fear and the boldness and courage of John. Though Herodias wanted him to, Herod would not put John to death because he was afraid of John, knowing that he was a just man and unholy, it says there. He, Herod recognized John's devotion to God. And then as a result, Herod was fearful of even greater consequences coming down on him by the judgment of God if he did anything to this obviously righteous and godly man. We learn something about John, though, in that. John was just or righteous or holy or set apart to God. Herod knew that. It was unmistakably clear to all. And as we live a transformed life by grace, we can have the same testimony as John's. As we live a righteous life and do what is right by God's word and are holy and live a life that clearly demonstrates that we belong to God and that we are set apart for his purposes. Verse 20 tells us that Herod would go and hear John speak either by visiting him in prison or having John brought before him. When Herod heard John, he, or that is Herod, did many things. It's, that's an interesting phrase. Kenneth Weiss defines this phrase as to be in straits, to be embarrassed, not to know which way to turn, to be perplexed. This was Herod's state of mind when he heard John. As a prophet, John spoke the word of God. This is the effect that the word can have on unbelievers. As its truth works on the heart, it can do many things. It can make one feel perplexed. It can make one feel shame. It can cause a person to not know which way to turn. And we can be sure that John confronted Herod with the truth of God. And Herod's dark sins and guilty conscience were exposed by the light of the word, causing him to do many things and to feel this way when he heard John. But when Herod heard John speak, he did not respond in faith. Instead, it just says that when he heard him, he heard him gladly. Now stop and think about that. that there are many who sit in pews who have not responded in faith to the word when they hear it. But they will sit there and listen to the word of God gladly. It, res it reminds us that not all who are in churches are saved, and we should not assume that they are. 
The gospel of grace needs to be faithfully proclaimed in the local church for this reason. Herodias's vindictive desire for re revenge did not wane, and she patiently waits for the most convenient time. And then verse 21 tells us that a convenient day came. We'll be returning to the program in just a minute. But first, we'd like to take this time to thank you, our partners, for making these programs possible. If you would like to access our library of helpful Bible study tools, go to BereanBibleSociety.org. Christmas Times is a gospel tract to reach the lost for Christ, written by Pastor Kevin Sadler, president of the Berean Bible Society. According to the Bible in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, apart from Christ, mankind is dead in trespasses and sins. We need the forgiveness of sins and the eternal life that only God can give in order to be sure of our future in heaven. Christmas Times covers Christmas past, Christmas present, and Christmas future. Christmas Times is sold in packs of 25. To order, contact the Berean Bible Society for pricing and availability at 262-255-4750 or visit our website at www.bereanbiblesociety.org. To receive our free full-color 32-page monthly magazine, The Berean Searchlight, call 262-255-4750 or subscribe online at www.bereanbiblesociety.org. Thank you again for your generous gifts. And now, back to the teaching with Pastor Kevin. Mark 6, 21-24 reads, And when a convenient day was come, that Herod on his birthday made a supper to his lords, high captains, and chief estates of Galilee. And when the daughter of the said Herodias came in and danced and pleased Herod and them that sat with him, the king said unto the damsel, Ask of me whatsoever thou wilt, and I will give it thee. And he sware unto her, Whatsoever thou shalt ask of me, I will give it thee unto the half of my kingdom. And she went forth and said unto her mother, What shall I ask? And she said, the head of John the Baptist. Herod on his birthday gave a banquet. He had a birthday celebration. To this banquet, he invited his lords, high captains, and chief estates of Galilee. Herod's lords were the nobles, leading men who held high civil offices under Herod. High captains were high-ranking military commanders. Chief estates were key social and business leaders of the region of Galilee. These were people who were in the upper echelons of Galilean society, a gathering composed of men from governmental, military, and civil life. Herod's birthday was a men's event, and all that went with that. Royal banquets were extravagant in their display of wealth and in their provision for pleasure. As they feasted, the daughter of Herodias came in and danced. She was the daughter of Herod's brother Philip and Herod's niece and stepdaughter. Her dancing enchanted and pleased Herod and these chief men of Galilee. The dance over, on impulse, Herod says to her, Ask of me whatsoever thou wilt, and I will give it thee. And then he paused, and then he went a step further, and he swore with an oath, Whatsoever thou shalt ask of me, I will give it thee unto the half of my kingdom. He gives the girl a blank check and promises to give her anything she wanted up to half of his kingdom. But the funny thing is that the truth of the matter was that he didn't have anything to give. His kingdom didn't belong to him. It belonged to Rome. It wasn't his to give. He couldn't give her half or any part of it. Intending to impress this gathering of leading men in Galilee, he goes over the top, makes a rash promise. He takes an oath and he binds himself to it. His lust mixed with his foolish pride led him to make a promise that was going to be very costly. Not knowing how to answer or what to ask for, the girl runs to her mother for her advice, who is not dining with the men at this feast. When Herodias' daughter said, What shall I ask? There was one thing her mother wanted more than anything else, the death of John the Baptist. That was at the top of her list. She wanted the prophet who had rebuked her sinful lifestyle dead. So this 
ungodly, wicked, vengeful woman uses her daughter as a pawn and tells her to ask Herod for the head of John the Baptist. Mark 6, 25 to 29 then reads, And she came in straightway with haste unto the king and asked, saying, I will that thou give me by and by in a charger the head of John the Baptist. And the king was exceeding sorry, yet for his oath's sake and for their sakes which sat with him, he would not reject her. And immediately the king sent an executioner and commanded his head to be brought. And he went and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head in a charger and gave it to the damsel. And the damsel gave it to her mother. And when his disciples heard of it, they came and took up his corpse and laid it in a tomb. Hearing her mother's request, Herodias' daughter came with haste. She ran back to Herod before the king could change his mind and tells him, I will that thou give me by and by in a charger the head of John the Baptist. The words by and by there mean immediately, instantly. The dancing girl came rushing in and wanted her wish granted at once. The apple didn't fall far from the tree with this girl and her mother. And as requested by her mother, she also asked for John's head in a charger or on a platter. It was not uncommon at that time to bring the head of one who had been slain to the person who ordered it as sure proof that the command had been obeyed. But Herodias wanted John's head presented on a platter. These were cold, ruthless people. When Herodias' daughter asked for this, Herod was trapped, he was cornered because of his oath and because he had to save face before those who sat with him or the group of influential dinner guests that he had in front of him. When Herod heard the girl's gruesome request, it says he was exceeding sorry. The king's wrath had, against John had subsided, and now he both feared and respected the prophet. He was sorry, but, as it says, but yet for his oath's sake and for their sakes which sat with him, he would not reject her. Because of his pride, he chose to be true to an oath meant only to impress a group of men. And he chose not to lose face before them rather than value a human life. And he did not refuse her request. And his pride won in the victory over the voice of his conscience. The result was a cold-blooded murder of an innocent, godly man. Immediately, Herod granted the girl's request, gave the order, sent an executioner, and commanded him to bring back John's head. The executioner went into the prison, beheaded John, brought his head on a bloody platter, and gave it to the dancing girl. And the girl then gave it to her mother, who we can only imagine felt pleased at the grisly sight of it. Afterwards, John's disciples were permitted to claim the decapitated body of John and give it a respectful burial and they laid it in a tomb with care. Luke chapter 7, verses 24 to 28 read, And when the messengers of John were departed, he began to speak unto the people concerning John. What went ye out into the wilderness for to see? A reed shaken with the wind? But what went ye out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they which are gorgeously apparelled and live delicately are in king's courts. But what went ye out for to see? A prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and much more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. For I say unto you, among those that are born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. Our Lord praises John in these verses, and I love the question the Lord asks. When you went out to see John in the wilderness... Was he like a reed shaken with the wind? The region of the uh, country that John preached in was overflowed annually by the Jordan River and produced many reeds of a light, fragile nature that were easily blown around by the wind. And so the question by the Lord is, if they saw a man who is like a reed, who is so easily moved, constantly changing, weak, vacillating, one who catered to the crowd? And the answer is not John, 
John was a man of conviction and courage, one who preached the message God gave him, who stood firmly for the truth and was not swayed. John in no way was a reed shaken with the wind. And that's how we need to be with the truth of God's word. Not one who's blown this way or that way so easily, but bold, standing firm for the truth and for the Lord. The Lord asked if John was a man who dressed in fine clothes and saw raiment, the kind worn in the king's palaces. Matthew 3, 4 says John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins. He didn't wear clothes like those in king's courts. He wore poor, coarse clothing. The Lord asks if they went out to see a prophet. And he says, yes, that John was a prophet and even more than a prophet, that he was a messenger. He was the messenger that was prophesied, the forerunner of the Messiah's ministry who would prepare his way. And Christ's statement here means that John fulfilled that ministry. And then Christ pays him the ultimate compliment. Among those that are born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. Now think about who, that, who said that? In Christ's eyes, John was greater than any and all the other Old Testament prophets. God used John's life, and he passionately lived for Christ. And think about what his life was about. His life was about pointing others to Christ. And that's the kind of life we should all lead as we are transformed by grace a life that points others to the Lord Jesus Christ. For nearly 80 years, the Berean Bible Society has endeavored to encourage believers everywhere to study God's Word. With this foundation, the believer is equipped to grow spiritually and energized to effectively share the gospel. Through the tools of both traditional and electronic media, we are positioned to reach our world well into the coming generations. Streaming lessons, printed materials, audio teachings, and daily devotionals are all available at the BereanBibleSociety.org. Thank you again for tuning in to Transformed by Grace. We appreciate your prayer support and the financial gifts. The purpose and mission of the Berean Bible Society is to help you understand the whole counsel of the Word of God. For more information, visit our website at www.bereanbiblesociety.org or give us a call at 262-255-4750. Or if you prefer, write us at the Berean Bible Society, P.O. Box 756, Germantown, Wisconsin, 53022. Now until next time, may you be transformed by God's grace.